Hello everyone, bonjour à tous. I'm going to speak in English because I do that a lot better than French. Um, so, when you said, I'm sure that's not going to last, did, what did you imply? You know, the schedule, we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> So, all right, thanks very much. Um, I would like to tell you a story. So this is about six, seven years ago. Um, I, I was walking around in the office in the hallway and I ran into a friend of mine, his name is Marcus. Back in the day when you could actually still run into people because some people were at the office. And uh, I said, hey Marcus, what's going on? Uh, what are you working on? And he said, well, you know, we're working on this translation component. It translates this from here to there. And uh, it's, it's uh, really interesting, very challenging. And I said, oh, that's interesting, translation component. Have you talked to um, your neighboring team right next door to Andreas? Because I think they're actually working on the same thing or something very, it sounds to me, it sounded very similar, a translation component of some kind. And he said, Yes, actually, I have. We have spoken to each other. And um, we, we looked and we said, if we just generalize both of our components a little bit, then we can both use it and save ourselves time and effort. And I said, that's great. You know, the reason why he told me this is because I was already one of the people running around in the office and evangelizing open and inner source. And uh, so I said, how is that coming along? Um, And he said, well, okay, so we went to our product owners. And so product owners is a business partner in one department of the big corporation, Mercedes-Benz. Yeah, so Marcus spoke to his product owner there and made that proposition. And Andreas, he talked to his product owner over there. And they introduced the idea of combining efforts and saving time and money. And the product owner said, oh, yeah, uh, that's a good idea. Yeah, but yeah, let's not do it anyway. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Wait, why? You said it's a good idea. Yeah, but you know, then we will have to talk to the other team a lot, and uh, there's going to be a lot of communication overhead. Um, and we have the budget. We don't need to save money, right? Okay. <laughs> wait a minute. Maybe don't need to, but it's still a good idea. Yeah, sure, but also. You know, in all fairness, um, so this shows that the mindset wasn't there yet for sharing, for doing inner source. And in all fairness, uh, we also didn't have the prerequisites really, because for one, the legal prerequisites weren't there. And for two, the technical prerequisites weren't there. Legal meaning we had contracts, you know, within the corporation, intercorporate contracts with one department, And they had the exclusive rights to code. We weren't even allowed to share this with another department, which is another entity, right? And uh, so you couldn't. And that's kind of stupid, right? Also, we didn't have the technical prerequisites because it was not all on one platform. It was, they, they used GitHub, they used GitLab. This is a stack. Um, um, uh, sorry, now I'm missing the name. Uh, um, Yeah, one of the other platforms, okay? And, um, oh yeah, Bitbucket, that's what I was looking for. And so everybody used different different uh, platforms. So sharing would have been possible, but difficult, okay? Um, so uh, clearly this is not a very desirable situation. And I was one of the people, as I said, running around evangelizing usage of inner and open source. And we would use stories like this to motivate this with the senior executives and say, look, We need to do something. Not doing open source, not doing inner source is not an option. To FOSS, free and open source software, to FOSS or not to FOSS, is simply not really a question anymore that we should be discussing. We should be discussing how to do it, all right? And so finally, after a lot of talking and a lot of motivation, a lot of stories, um, we were able to reach the, the C-level people and, and they listened to us and they said, Yes, actually, I think we should take this into our strategy. So open source, inner source was taken into our corporate strategy and we had, we were good to go and now we could work on how to do it. 
Okay? And so in the following, the remainder of this talk, I'm going to share with you uh, some of the crucial steps that we undertook and that we went through uh, on our way to open source. And this may not exactly work for you, exactly like this, but uh, perhaps it can be a bit of an inspiration and you can get some good ideas. Okay, so the first step here is create the internal awareness, talk to people, make sure they understand. And um, yeah, so you can tell I'm a computer scientist because I start my enumerations with zero. Okay, so th this is zero, right? <laughs> and there's one and two, okay. But so this is the prerequisite sort of, that's why I named it zero. The first one then, after we had to go from the, from the sea level, uh, we said, okay, now we need to create an or open source program office, an OSPO, okay, to make sure that the strategy is put into effect. Now, if maybe you still need to convince some people, uh, here are just some quotes that I like, that I think are, are quite um, showing this in a, in a very plastic way. So, the open source program office is an essential part of any modern company with a reasonably ambitious plan to influence various sectors of software ecosystems. Yes, and most of our companies say, yeah, we're modern and we want to do something here. So. Here's this, and then the next thing is whether you know it yet or not, open source is very much at the center of your business. And an OSPO is simply the realization of that reality and the best way to yield the most benefits from open source participation. And what that means is, uh, you know, you can have parts of the company doing open source and, and they're doing it this way and they're doing it that way and then they have another idea, but to make this a centralized effort, uh, that's, a good idea, as I think I will show you in uh, the next few slides, okay? Um, open source is at the center of your business. You probably all have heard the, the sentence, uh, software is eating the world, yeah? You know, meaning software companies are taking over traditional businesses and they're just software companies. So Amazon, they, they used to sell books, but um, now they sell a lot more than that, of course. Uh, they put a lot of regular old-fashioned bookstores out of business by selling stuff online. And they're a software company. Or Uber, they don't even own any cars. They're a software company. Uh, Airbnb, they don't own any property. They're a software company. right? So this means software is eating the world. And then somebody added, an open source is eating software. right? So. I, I like to say, you just can't develop software anymore these days without doing open source, okay? So here, um, typical tasks of an open source program office are here. Uh, not exclusive, but these are some of the main, ta main tasks. So define what does it mean to have an open source strategy. And when I say open source, I usually include inner source as well. Some companies divide it. They have an OSPO and an ESPO. Um, we do it all in our OSPO, realizing that it's called open source office, but it includes inner source. Okay, define a strategy, uh, define policy and rules. So as I said, that nobody is doing, not, not everybody's doing it in their own way. Uh, establish processes. How do you do an open source contribution? Then uh, obviously it's an IT topic, so you wanna talk about tools for automation, for development. Maybe get everybody on one platform, or maybe two platforms, but not on 10 platforms, because that makes sharing a lot more difficult. Um, then uh, internal knowledge through trainings, I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a bit. Community management and communications, very important. Open source publications, because you know, open source, you want to publish your own stuff too. Memberships and foundations, and the external visibility. Okay, and I will get into each one of these topics, or most of, not each one, most of them, in a bit. So here, this is the structure of our OSPO. Uh, we have some organizational staff that help us with all kinds of organizational things. Then uh, there's governance. You need governance because uh, there are a lot of rules out there in open source, especially when it comes down to licenses and uh, you want to make sure that your people understand licenses and that you don't have violations because they can be extremely costly uh, and extremely dangerous. They can even threaten your company, right? If you put a, up uh, for a lawsuit with hundreds of millions, that would not be nice. Or if you're forced to publish your code that is actually kind of secret because you, you used a uh, copyleft license, uh, 
Yeah, you just want to be careful. So you need governance. Then uh, they shouldn't, in my opinion, by the way, in a lot of big companies are very much dominated by legal. And uh, that's understandable and justifiable. But um, they shouldn't run the open source office, in my opinion. They should have an, a very important voice, for sure. Um, but it's actually the techie guys that should maybe... Well, okay, I don't know. I don't want to say they should dominate. It, it should just all be equal, okay? But it's clearly a technical topic, so you need people with technical expertise, for sure. And then community management. Sometimes that is actually overlooked, uh, but it's very important because what is a successful open source project? It's one that people use, that people talk about, that people participate in. Huh? So that has a big community. And communities like that, they just don't, they don't just, you know, start to exist by themselves. Very, very rarely does that happen. You know, so a lot of software engineers, they think, hey, if, if my project is good, people will automatically find out and know about it and it will spread the good news. But it doesn't usually happen, okay? Because there's so many good open source projects that nobody knows about. Um, yeah, so. Only 2% of open source projects are actually successful, right? And out of those 2%, uh, maybe one quarter is really, really successful and the rest is already less successful. And you need good community management, okay? Then there's an OSPO lead, typically. And then what we have here is FOSS coordinators. These are the links to our business units. We call them business streams. Um, we can't answer all the questions that our internal community has about open source because it's just overwhelming, it's too big. So we have the FOSS coordinators. They talk to us and they are a part of their business units. And so they're, they're the um, multipliers that carry our topics into the business units and bring the business units topics into the OSPO, okay? Really important concept. I think it helps a lot. And, and by the way, this is a community in itself too, the FOSS coordinators community, right? We meet with them every two months or so and give them the news and say, so what's going on with you? Tell us, what, what do you need? Okay, and, and they can help each other out as well. All right, so that's that. And then embrace FOSS. We said we wanted to embrace FOSS. But what does that even mean? So there are three main things about open source. And the, so the first one is use. Um, it means that you use open source software during your daily work. There are still some companies out there that say, yeah, but we don't use open source. But remember that when you buy third party software, that could contain open source. And so you actually are using open source. I don't think there is any company out there that doesn't use open source, even though sometimes they still think that. Then contribute means contribute something back to an open source component. Um, and create is you publish your own stuff as open source. Okay? And embrace means all of this and more. And I'll get to what more can mean. Okay? Um, I realize I'm at an open source conference, so I don't need to tell you the basics here, just making sure that we're aligned. Um, so here, this is, this is just something I found noteworthy. So maybe you know um, Synopsys, that's a company behind Black Duck, and uh, they come out with an annual open source risk analysis, security and risk analysis report, and the one from last year found that 97% of all the code bases they looked at contained open source software and 70%, 78% of the code in these code bases was in fact open source software, all right? And uh, they divided further down into, into uh, various sectors of business. And so we at Mercedes, of course, are here in this part, and they found out in this, in this area, it's also 97% that uses open source, and 60% of the total code was composed of open source, all right? Um, they also found, just as a side note, 60% of the code had open source vulnerabilities. This talk is not about this, but it's just something to keep in mind. 60%, that's a lot. Okay, It, it just means here the message is be careful and, and look at if you have problems here. Right? So, um, talk about contributions and publishing your own code, code as open source. 
Because a lot of times companies, they just consume, but they don't contribute back. Because they're like, well, you know, it's free. We can use it. Why should we invest time, money, and effort to contribute back? Well, for one, it's the right thing to do. Yeah? And, and it's just being nice. If you consume, you know, give back. However, uh, that's the least of reasons, actually. And when the economic times get tough, things that are nice to have or the right thing to do are the first things that get dropped. But you shouldn't drop this. You know, right now, economic times are looking to get tough or are already tough. Um, the reason why you should still contribute and publish your own stuff as open source is uh, this here. There are more reasons, but this is one of the most compelling ones, especially when you talk to senior executives about budgets. So uh, Frank Nagel is a professor at the Harvard Business School, and he did a, a very extensive study and found out that companies who actively contribute back benefit twice as much monetarily as compared to companies who only use open source. That is interesting. And the reason is because when you contribute, you go through a feedback process with the open source community, with some of the brightest minds out there in IT. And this is, this is basically an internal training program for your engineers, right? Because you get challenged not just by your team, who are probably really good, but by a lot more really brilliant people out there in open source, right? And this makes you better and better. And this is not a one-time effect only. This is something that keeps giving as you go along, okay? So I found this a really good reason. So um, more reasons why you should embrace FOSS. Uh, we, we made a little video. Uh, it's two minutes. I'm going to show you the video. It's just two minutes. The guy here behind me, uh, that is Jan Brecht. He's the CIO of Mercedes-Benz uh, Group. And he's very fond of open source. So he supports it and he likes it. And, and he always tells us, do open source. And uh, we did this little video for a senior executive management meeting uh, to motivate why open source is good. And just so a summary, why should you embrace FOSS? Okay. I hope the sound is going to work. Let's see. Uh, two minutes. Sit back and... Watch the video. So why should you embrace FOSS in your team? Well, for one, he really likes FOSS, so you can make him happy. But that shouldn't be the real reason behind it. Let me give you some pointers. Innovation nowadays happens to a large degree in the FOSS domain. Therefore, doing FOSS can speed up our access to innovative technologies to be at the forefront where automotive goes digital. Second, with FOSS, we are achieving a much higher efficiency in software development. It fosters reuse and it's cheaper and easier on your engineer. You save yourself time and money and you can go faster and faster. And this will give us the freedom to focus even more on our USPs. Also, it's in your own best interest by being active in FOSS, and not only use it, you can steer open source projects in the direction you need them. Contributions are the currency of open source. It is how you provide influence to the project your business depends on. And what's even more, our FOSS endeavors help us to attract new talent. We need software engineers, that's a fact and they are attracted to open source like a moth to a flame. Trust me on this. Plus, participating in open source is like a continuous internal training program for the engineers that we already have, as has been proven in Harvard's study. Our engineers will learn and get better and better. And this isn't the one-time effect only, which merely occurs at the beginning. The advantages of the learning process will keep going on over and over and over again. Well, I can think of at least 10 more good reasons why you should be active in FOSS. Bottom line is, for software development, FOSS is like the air you breathe. You need it, and that's all there is to it. So please, open. Open up as much as you can, because it makes us all so much better.
Uh, thanks. So, um, in case you were distracted, this is what I said. Okay. Here, these are the main points summarized. I'm not going to go over them again, but um, you, you'll, you'll get the slides, I think, or you can download them. So, a lot of reasons why you should embrace FOSS. Please open up, and with FOSS, you can do magic. Um, so, now we had open and near source in our corporate IT strategy, and it was working, sort of, you know, it was kind of trickling down from from uh, top to bottom and bottom up, but we still felt there's something more we should do so people will really get it. Because we would still have a lot of people ask us like, but so can we do open source now? Because that didn't used to be the case. Is it okay now? And uh, can we do this in our working time or uh, when should we do it? Because that also didn't have to, didn't always be the case, right? Um, so sometimes engineers would go home and uh, in with their private accounts, contribute something to open source so they could use it the next day for their work. And that's uh, clearly not uh, good and intended because, you know, it's against working laws. And if you do something for the company, you should, that's of course on company time, right? And so we wanted to do something a bit more radical to give our engineers the security and the mission. And so we wrote the FOSS uh, the FOSS, the Mercedes-Benz FOSS Manifesto. So a colleague of mine, Basim Vazegi and myself, we wrote this, and it is a set of guidelines which uh, show the importance of FOSS for, more, for a modern tech organization. And um, it has three parts. I'm going to show you these three parts real quick. And the goal is to facilitate the cultural change in the company, because a lot of times that's more challenging than the rest. All right. And it doesn't only give our engineers the, you know, the permission to do FOSS, to be active in FOSS, but it actually actively sends them on that mission. All right. So here is the preamble. This is just it sort of to set the stage and give the whole thing a solemn note. You know, so it says the Mercedes-Benz FOSS Center of Competence and the CIO, showing that this is endorsed by the very top. So our CIO, he actually even showed it to the Daimler Board of Management, Ola Kelenius and, and the, the other board members, and they endorsed it as well. So we're good to go. And uh, so here, resolved, blah, 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 have decided to establish these FOSS guiding principles. If you uh, have ever read the, um, the Treaty on the European Union, uh, maybe this is a bit familiar because I looked at that and I kind of, you know, uh, wrote it a little bit similarly, because who hasn't read the Treaty on the European Union, right? It's everybody should. Okay, but anyway, so here this is this, and then now the important parts, company principles and employee principles. So the company principles here first says, Mercedes-Benz shall support and encourage its employees to use, contribute to, and create FOSS projects both in open and inner source endeavors. Very important. So I, I mean, I, I realize that FOSS, you know, doesn't actually say inner source, and this is kind of a funny wording, but um, it's the well, we juggle around with a lot of words, so this is good. And then, so number two, Mercedes-Benz shall allow the appropriate time for its employees to participate in FOSS. Okay, if you work in open source, it is working time. Uh, three, Mercedes-Benz shall encourage and facilitate learning and advancement. I think that's probably pretty clear. Obviously, you should learn in advance. Um, sometimes, especially again in tough economic times, you know, say the say CFO, the chief financial officer, says, "But yeah, but what if we send our people on expensive trainings and then they quit the company?" Yeah. To which the answer is, "What if you don't train your employees and they stay?" All right. So I mean, you <laughs> got to take risks sometimes. Um, Four, Mercedes-Benz shall promote visibility in open source communities. For example, this one, or um, members and foundations, I'll get to that. The employee principles. Um, an engineer shall look for open and near source alternatives before writing custom code or using proprietary alternatives. So please, before you yeah, spend money on writing your own code or buying something, isn't there a good solution in open source? or in inner source. So you, it used to be make or buy when you needed new software. Now it's FOSS make or buy, but FOSS first, yeah? Uh, two, an engineer shall strive to be active in the inner source communities. And three, 
and engineers shall contribute to open source projects within the scope of the day-to-day -day work. Um, so if you really like Minecraft and you want to contribute to Minecraft project, maybe that's not in the scope of your day-to-day -day work, but if it is, fine, you know, go ahead and do it. But it should be kind of work focused, but usually it is. And then four, that's a, a brief mini code of conduct and employees shall act responsibly in open inner source communities. Remember that how you behave out there will reflect back on the company as a whole. So in short, be nice. Okay, and uh, so you can find the Mercedes-Benz FOSS manifesto here on this web page. Uh, here in Manifesto, we have put it under Creative Commons Zero License, the least restrictive license. Uh, there is a link to a GitHub repository. You can, if you're interested, you can take this uh, manifesto for your own purposes. You can do with it anything you like. Uh, you can change it, uh, add stuff, leave stuff off. You don't have to credit us. It, it's yours, public domain, okay? And uh, nicely enough, Two big companies already have taken it over, so that's Continental AG, uh, which is a big automotive supplier, one of the biggest in the world. And they have, at the beginning of this year, published the Continental Automotive FOSS Manifesto. Uh, they have taken this as a blueprint, ours as a blueprint, and then changed it and adapted it to their corporate values. And uh, now it's the Continental Automotive FOSS Manifesto. And Siemens, they just did this uh, three, four weeks ago and published uh, their Siemens FOSS Manifesto. And so I think this is really cool. Um, hopefully more and more companies can adapt it because it really sets a sign, you know. They publish it and then they show the world we are committed to open source, okay? Uh, four, train your employees. So, there are a lot of open source trainings out there that are really good. So I'm not telling you to uh, come up with your own trainings necessarily for the general content, but maybe it's a good idea to train your employees towards a bit more company specific content. Okay. And that's what we did. We developed these five trainings and they're called uh, the, well, we're uh, automotive company. So it's the driver's license for FOSS, right? Um, Awareness, that's for everybody. Um, just tell what is FOSS, why is FOSS good, and so forth. And then use is for everybody who wants to use open source. Contribute if you want to contribute back because there's some additional things you have to take into consideration. And then create if you want to publish your own open source stuff. And then lastly, the latest edition was here, the inner source driver's license. So these trainings are kind of nice. Uh, they're online. They're about half an hour to one hour. Uh, they're visually uh, nicely made and we even won an, an award for these, like a training um, award, like an external award, right? So we're, we think this is kind of nice. Uh, foundations and sponsorships. So uh, open source foundations are doing a tremendous job. And so we have become Founding members of the Eclipse Foundation Europe a few years ago. We're still strategic member members for the Eclipse Foundation. We have recently joined the Software Defined Vehicle Working Group within the Eclipse Foundation, which puts us together with all, with a lot of other companies, not all, uh, with a lot of automotive and non automotive companies to work on this uh, software defined vehicle topic. This is, I think, this is going to be really cool. Or it is already, but uh, I think great things will come out of it. And it shows how open source can be used to collaborate between corporations. That used to be much more difficult, yeah, because of antitrust laws. But if you're in the open source domain, you can get together with all your competitors and non-competitors and do great stuff together. Yeah, things that are not competitively advantageous, you know, meaning as an automotive company, we will not bring our autonomous driving algorithms there, yeah, because that's how we try to make money. Uh, but general stuff that everybody needs, why should everybody develop this on their own? It's just, let's do it together, and it will be for the benefit of everyone. Okay, uh, then we have, we're members of the Lynx Foundation, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, within the Linux Foundation, and a few more. So foundations are a great thing. Right. Then we do FOSS sponsorings. This is the, you know, embrace all of this and more. Yeah, foundation memberships. Here is sponsoring. So 
Um, I, I need to stop. OK, it's actually just a couple more slides, right? <laughs> well, you save the time so I can use it. Um, so we donate money to open source projects because we think they're doing a great job. And so we give them money as, a, as an appreciation. Uh, currently, we do, we do this with GitHub sponsors. Um, if you go to the website, you know, uh, github.com slash Mercedes-Benz, you'll find a different number than, what does it say here? T 34, right now I think it's tw 24, but I'm going to add about 20 more projects in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so th I think this is awesome. Consider doing this as well, because if a lot of us are doing it, you know, everybody contributes a little bit of money, a lot of us are doing it, we can maybe prevent things like the lock for shell problem and so forth because then these people that are doing tremendous good work in open source, they can concentrate on their open source work and don't have to uh, do this as a, as a you know, nighttime job next to their full-time day job. Okay, and lastly, have fun with FOSS. For me, that always helps. Um, so, so we had a, uh, Mercedes-Benz FOSS convention with about 80 participants last year and then you know we gave him a tour through the Mercedes-Benz arena in Stuttgart and where the headquarters is. Then uh, here this is at the KubeCon in Amsterdam just a few weeks ago where there was a lot of us and and we even got an award the Com Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, award. Uh, here we did a little video with GitHub about GitHub and Mercedes collaboration which will be published soon. And then oh, this here is, this is me at the FOSS backstage in Berlin, online. This is uh, like two years ago when it was just only online. You know, people were getting sick and tired of watching online, you know. And so I just kind of wanted to do something fun for me to have fun and for people to maybe watch that talk. And so I dressed up as a pirate and I brought all the props. I had a bottle of rum and some gold and a, and a treasure map, you know, and I talked like a pirate. And it was, it was actually fun. Um, still, I think, the most viewed talk from the conference. <laughs> I didn't tell my comms department I was going to dress up before. I think they would have had something to say about that. But uh, in the end, they said, oh, yeah, fine, good. All right, um, that's it. So I think today our product owners from the beginning, you know, the mindset now is right. Uh, the prerequisites are there. And if I went to approach them again today, I think they would say, yes, that's a good idea, and let's actually do it. There are a lot of things at Mercedes-Benz that we still need to work on with regard to open source, and it's never finished, of course. You know, this is not a, a project that ends. It's a process that keeps on going and changing. Um, but I think we're on a good path. And yeah, as I said, I think the product owners would say, it's a good idea, and yes, let's do it together. Let's collaborate. All right, thanks very much.